Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to conservation and careful management of the state's forests to make them more resilient and better habitats for wildlife. Choosewood.com. Welcome to St. Louis on the Air. I'm Sarah Fenske. On November 19, 1919, the International Institute opened its doors for the first time. Originally a project of the YWCA, it was one of 50 such organizations around the country designed to help immigrants and refugees. The St. Louis iteration separated from its parent organization just four years later, and the rest is history. The organization now serves more than 6,000 immigrants every year. The International Institute's CEO, Anna Crossland, is with us today to talk about just that. Anna, welcome back to the show. Hello. So today we think of the International Institute as helping immigrants and and refugees from all over. But back in 1919, I imagine things were a little bit different. Who was moving to St. Louis 100 years ago? Well, you know, it was still uh, a lot of people from different countries, dozens of countries. But they were primarily European Southern European, Eastern European, Northern European, but European. And that's one of the big differences today. Obviously, they come from all over the world with a significant number of them from Asia and uh, Africa and, and Latin America. And so it's it's much more diverse. When did St. Louis begin to see that shift from a European-based immigration to all around the world? Well, you know, it wasn't just St. Louis, but it was, in fact, the United States. And a lot of it had to do with anti-immigrant uh, rhetoric. Today, we think, in fact, that America is anti-immigrant. We hear a lot of, of claims of that. But the reality is we've always been conflicted about immigration. And if you were to look back at the beginning of the 19th century, you would find that there was a huge backlash against immigrants at the time, to the point where in 1924, in fact, just five years after the International Institute was founded, the Immigration Act of 1924 was established. And at that point, they set quotas for the very first time in this country. Mm-hmm. And the quotas were set, set based on arrivals in 1890, a uh, percentage of arrivals in 1890. That meant there were no Italians that were allowed and there weren't Jews allowed because that was the purpose was they wanted to exclude at the time. Um, And then America really um, primarily uh, settled Northern Europeans for about 40 years until the Immigration Act of 1965 with Lyndon Baines Johnson. And at that time, then, all of the areas of the world were opened up. Okay. And that's why we're seeing the diversity that that you now handle. How many countries? uh, Do you have any sense of just how many countries you've seen? Well, on an annual basis right now, we actually serve uh, about 6,500 immigrants from 80 countries. Wow. So that's a very diverse group coming right here to St. Louis. Well, you know, I often say that St. Louis is as diverse as Chicago is. Um, It's just that whereas in Chicago, they might have a handful of a different population. uh, They might have thousands of a a population like um, Sri Lankans. We might have a handful instead. So we have the diversity. We just don't have the numbers in quite the same way. Now, take us back 100 years ago. What did the International Institute focus on in those early years? Well, you know, if you were to look at our mission over 100 years, it really hasn't changed all that much. We're still about being able to help uh, newcomers integrate into the community and about helping the uh, community better understand and appreciate those newcomers. How we did it obviously has evolved. In those early years, uh, we had very few staff at the International Institute, lots of volunteers. They tell wonderful stories, in fact, about how volunteer uh, English teachers would uh, travel over to the stockyards on the east side uh, and um, teach English to Mexicans who were living in the box car over there. And it was really cha- challenged because every week they'd go over there, boxcars had been moved. They, they didn't know where their, where their English class was going to happen. So it was literally a floating population that was occurring at that time. Uh, you know, it's wonderful kinds of it. Our first, our first uh, um, offices, in fact, were um, on the second floor on South Broadway above a saloon and a dance hall that was right across from the brewery. And so there was all this noise that would occur in the evening because it was kind of lively downstairs. So, you know, but that's where the immigrant community lived in those days was on the south side. So they went they went to where the immigrants lived. And that's still, with regards to at least the refugees in the city population, we still live, we still operate on the northern edge of the International District uh, on South Grand. And so we're very close to where the immigrants in the city live. And so today, um, you know, I know things have changed in in recent years because of how Trump is, is dealing with refugees. But let's just look overall and say the last decade. What percentage of your services would you say are there to help refugees versus immigrants as a whole? 
Well, you know, it depends on the stage in our history in the last 40 or 50 years and also the number of refugees that have been arriving. So if you were to look at back in the early 1980s when the huge number of Vietnamese boat people, for instance, were arriving, or in the 90s when the large number of Bosnians were arriving, then the bulk of the people that we were actually serving were refugees because so many were arriving on an annual basis. Over a th- We were sponsoring over 1,000 refugees mm-hmm. every year in those, in, in those uh, periods. But, you know, more recently, you know, you've got a couple hundred refugees. And so the balance of the individuals are, in fact, people who are uh, here with immigrant status, permanent residents. They may be spouses, for instance, of foreign students at the universities. They could be people who are here with other temporary status, et cetera. So there are a variety of other kinds of statuses that fill in. One of the programs that we've really started to work more heavily on lately, because we've had the time, in fact, is our career path services for immigrants. Immigrants. And those are people who are underemployed or unemployed immigrants who arrive over here. They may have been a physical therapist or an engineer overseas, and they're driving a cab because mm-hmm. nobody has the ability to be able, the skills to be able to help them get recertified again. So we've, in fact, been able to expand some programs because we haven't had the large number of refugees to deal with um, during those periods. So it's, it's, it's bad that we don't have refugees for lots of different reasons, but we've been plenty busy in spite of that. So we're also going to talk today to two people who came to St. Louis as immigrants and have been involved with the International Institute in various ways. And uh, let's meet them now. Uh, First is Carmen Dents. Uh, She's a native of Columbia and was a professor of radiology at Washington University prior to her retirement. She moved to St. Louis in the 1970s. Uh, Carmen, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And we're also joined by Akif Tsogo. He grew up in Bosnia and Herzegovina and moved to St. Louis. Louis in 2001. He's also the founder of the nonprofit organization St. Louis Bosnians Inc. Akif, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Now, for those of you listening, um, are you an immigrant who settled in St. Louis? Did the International Institute play a role in your journey? You can give us a call at 314-382-8255. That's 382-TALK. Or you can send us a tweet at STL on air or email us at talk at stlpublicradio.org. Carmen, let's start with you. Tell us about your journey. What led you to the U.S. in the first place? Yes. Um, It was um, a journey motivated by educational goals. I have finished my undergraduate as a pharmaceutical scientist in my hometown, Barranquilla, and, and then I continue with the aspiration of going to graduate school. Um, I applied to different programs, university. My forte was really French. I thought that eventually I will be traveling to France to continue in an area of organic chemistry. That didn't happen. Colombia have a very good program with Florida, called Colombia Florida Alliance. Uh, and it was managed by another big program, ICETEX. Eventually, I did get a full scholarship that brought me in 1969 from uh, Cali, Colombia, where I was the head of the uh, pharmacy uh, department there at the hospital, came to Tallahassee uh, and did my graduate work at Florida State University, where I graduated in 72. Okay. And then what brought you to St. Louis? Uh, After some postgraduate work, uh, I was working in uh, Columbus, Ohio. Looked like Midwest was was Mm -hmm. all my life uh, after Florida. Uh, I have uh, been the TA of a young professor, assistant professor, while I was at Florida State University strictly academic. Seven years later, we met again in Columbus, Ohio. He's a native of Toledo, Ohio. Oh, okay. And love flourish. And <laughs> fell in love with the Midwest. Fell in love with the Midwest. <laughs> Once and you do that, there's no getting out. <laughs> <laughs> they, they keep you here. <laughs> exactly. So eventually he was already, he's also a scientist and a mathematician, and he was associated with Washington University um, prior to that. So returning after a hiatus outside and a, and a big 
uh, part of other chapter of my life. And what got you involved with the International Institute here? My involvement with the International Institute dates more than 30 years ago. Wow. Um, I, science and, and art had been, you know, my, my two loves. And, and I was uh, involved with the very early International Folk Fest. Uh, we didn't have a big venue then. The, the festival kept changing because we were growing mm-hmm. year by year. But eventually, um, I found myself in the, in the verge of just in getting my own dance group. And I would say the International Institute, the festival, starting with Folk Fest and turning into Festival of Nations, was a strong, a strong cultural motivation for me to create my own dance group, to bring to the community, not just during the time of the festival, but throughout the, the entire year, mm-hmm. what what we could do to enhance the values of the Hispanic community in general and, and many other nationalities that we are associated with. Those festivals are huge for sort of bringing the community together. Exactly. Um, Akif Sogo, tell us just a little bit about your story. Um, you are a Bosnian, and St. Louis, um, we got lucky enough to get so many Bosnians. You were sort of at the end of that wave, is that correct? Yes, absolutely. I came in in 2001, and that is, that is really toward the end of the Bosnian refugee settlement. Mm-hmm. So uh, Bosnians are still coming to St. Louis through the marriage mm-hmm. primarily, but um, at the time I was one of the last that uh, came in Um, and um, in a post-conflict Bosnia the uh, internal displacement together with the um, economical struggles um, kind of encouraged us to to look elsewhere to to try and um, uh, leave the country at the time so we did so Um, I had an uncle who was in uh, Chicago at the time but was in the process of moving to St. Louis uh, primarily so, so because fate of the intervened. Month. Absolutely, <laughs> it, it did. So uh, we came directly in 2001, in August of 2001, we came directly to St. Louis from uh, Bosnia. Wow. So August of 2001, that's certainly a yes. time where, um, you know, that's an interesting time to be moving. To yes, I city. actually just this past year turned 18 years in the United States. And that was a half point of how much time I spent in Bosnia versus in the United States. So, wow. Yeah. So you've, you've now been here longer than you were in Europe. Yes. yes. I had uh, the same case with me living in 1969 means that in this year I would have been here 50 years, much longer than I ever lived in Colombia. (laughs) (laughs) So we are sharing something that perhaps is not unique, especially when people have, um, you know, a long history of making St. Louis a home or making United States a home. Um, we're talking today to Anna Crossland, the CEO of the International Institute, as well as Carmen Dentz and Akif Sogo. We need to take a quick break. We'll be back shortly to continue this conversation. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio, 90.7 KWMU. And now back to our conversation. We're here today with Anna Crossland, the CEO of the International Institute, which is celebrating um, 100 years in St. Louis. We're also joined by Carmen Dentz, who came to the U.S. from Colombia, and Akif Sogo, who was part of the wave of Bosnians who settled in St. Louis. Now, Akif, you had mentioned that you moved to St. Louis in August of 2001, and obviously September of 2001. There were some major events that sort of changed uh, the U.S.'s relationship with the rest of the world. Where were you on September 11th when you, you heard about the planes hitting the towers? Yeah. Um, well, um, we were less than two weeks in the United States at that point of time, and um, as early arrivals, we were heavily dependent on the International Institute and services that were offered by the International Institute. And that particular morning, we were at the International Institute's uh, former location on Grand Avenue um, for English classes. And that particular morning, we were in class uh, when the events started developing. Uh, we heard commotion outside um, in a hallway. So we kind of stopped with the uh, lecturing and went outside, and we were witnessing what was going on. Um, on the TV at that time, and it was an extremely emotional situation. 
uh, for all of us, especially for uh, the refugees that were coming from the highly conflict um, areas of the world. And um, it, we were really in awe there for, for a really long time. And uh, uh, shortly after, we were dismissed to go home. And uh, we lived at the time probably about a mile away from International Institute, so fairly close. Uh, but we didn't wait, as we usually do, for someone to pick us up and take us home. Uh, we decided to walk home and really silence. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a group of us that lived in the same apartment complex that were taking uh, classes, and uh, we walked for that mile almost without saying a word, mm -hmm. uh, just kind of keeping to ourselves and uh, with our own thoughts of and uh, trying to process what was going on. It was, uh, yeah, traumatic, to say the least. Now, in the months that followed, um, things got hard in many ways for Muslims in the U.S. There was sort of a backlash that hit people who had nothing to do with, with what had happened. Was that a difficult time for you? Um, I, I can't say necessarily that it was a difficult time for me as a Bosnian uh, Caucasian Muslim, but I know for uh, a fact that other Muslims that were coming, especially from the uh, Middle East areas and uh, such, that they had a, a harder time than we did. Uh, we were able to blend in in many ways in the uh, society, and uh, I think that it helped us uh, in many ways, including the one that it's really often related to Islamophobia. Mm -hmm. Anna Crossland, for you, yes. running this organization that helps immigrants, mm -hmm. um, when something like that happens and there ends up being kind of a wave of, of people being fearful of the other, how does the organization deal with something like that? You know, a lot of it has to do with, um, uh, with uh, attempts to educate two groups. One of the um, our clients themselves and being able to help them understand what their rights are, but also what their responsibilities are, um, it, to take precautions where, where necessary uh, or where advantageous, but also then reaching out to the broader community to be able to help them understand um, that each individual is unique, that, um, that the kinds of horror that had been perpetrated in New York had nothing to do with people here in St. Louis. And that's a lot of what we really try to be able to help people do. One of the reasons my, my belief is that people are in fact um, as anti, whatever we want to call anti this, anti that, but in this case anti-Muslim, is because they've grown up in a world where they really haven't had an opportunity to meet and get to know people who are not like them. Mm -hmm. And so many of our uh, public speaking opportunities, Festival of Nations, et cetera, it's all uh, geared toward trying to demystify the other so that um, people are less fearful, that they can find out that there are, in fact, shared values and behaviors among people that go beyond the visible uh, differences. And, um, and so that's what it's really about. But in these days, following, you know, 9-11. It was about working with the police, in fact, to be able to, um, there was a lot of bullying going on in the schools for the elementary kids, particularly, you know, we were arranging to have police uh, at bus stops where kids were being dropped off, particularly young girls in hijabs because uh, of the heckling that was going on by drivers, you know, coming by, et cetera. And, and then working with the parents to be able to help them understand how to be able to feel as safe as possible um, in an environment with a lot of people who really did not understand them mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and their motivations versus the motivations of these terrorists. How does that compare to the moment that we're in now with some of the rhetoric coming from the president about immigration? Well, you know, it's not just rhetoric coming from the president. We have to be honest and say there's a lot of rhetoric coming from a lot of different directions, including the 24-hour news cycle right now that mm -hmm. uh, that uh, uh, commentators, uh, you know, entertainers, if you want to call it that, on the 24-hour news cycle is really are, are really kind of perpetrating. Purpose, you know, psyching up people about this this kind of a thing as well, including the the president. There seems to be this back and forth going on in that kind of a case. But there is no question that there's an anti-immigrant uh, sentiment right now that's that's going on, um, and that it's very. Um, it is very, uh, it's hurtful to the individuals themselves, to the foreign-born individuals themselves, because these are people who really um, have come over here, and this is their new home. This is their new nation. They think of themselves as Americans first.
first at this point. And so to have someone else say, no, no, you're not welcome, you're a second-class citizen is very, very hurtful to them. And we're just, and so that kind of a thing's going on. But it's really about, as I said, trying to be able to break down these barriers and get to the people whose minds you can change, because you can't change all of them. You have to figure out whether this is an individual who may be open to having a discussion and then figuring out how to be able to have that discussion in a positive manner. And perhaps that um, anti-immigrant sentiment is this something that we experienced more than Islamophobia in the Bosnian community just because we are arriving from somewhere else and uh, uh, someone is able to recognize by our accents mm -hmm. that we uh, may not be born here. They may and not know where you're from or exactly. what your religion is, but they can tell that's not a St. Louis accent. Exactly. And uh, we were exposed to more of that anti-immigration sentiment through that rather than Islamophobia. Now, Carmen, you moved here decades ago, back when the population population in St. Louis was was much more native born than it is today. Was it hard to, to sort of find your footing in this city? Um, in a personal way, no, it wasn't because Great. they needed me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and it was a very a strong feeling of being committed to the um, education. Uh, I was in a field related to medicine, so acquiring a legal status was it's, nothing. It was, easy it was so easy. Yeah. So I, I really have to say that that I felt that I was being recognized for the contributions that we, I was making, and it didn't matter whether my accent was strong, which it still is, and and I always say be proud of it because that means that you know more than one language. Um, I say right now with respect to the Hispanic population in general, you know, uh, it's not that we feel that we are targeted more than any other group. I mean, we are all in the same, in the same um, state of, of being uncomfortable uh, with w the complete dismantling of, of really good, good behavior and good matters to anyone that, that it doesn't look like yourself mm -hmm. yeah so so that is the the question that that i feel the hispanic community is dealing constantly mm -hmm. we are a very cohesive group doesn't matter what country we come from mm -hmm. and and we are doing all that we can to to really smooth out and increase as anna said the understanding that that we are all together here. Mm -hmm. and Anna Crossland, we have time for just one last quick question. But as you look yeah. back on this 100 years, um, what are you looking forward to for the <laughs> next the next 10? Well, I've only been there for 40 years, <laughs> not for the whole 100. I, I wish to qualify that. But as I look at the next, uh, at the next uh, uh, century or two, really it's about going uh, virtual in a way uh, so that we can reach people who are outside of the major, um, you know, locations in the cities. And so, you know, it's not just about St. Louis and St. Louis region, but it's about uh, Cape Girardeau and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So virtual is one of the things we're really looking at. How do we deliver the services but do it uh, using using technology? Anna Crossland, CEO of the International Institute, thank you for joining us. And Carmen Dens and Akif Sogo, uh, thank you so much for being here. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio 90.7 KWMU. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association. Missouri produces wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details on the variety of products made in the state are at ChooseWood.com.